Thank you, Vanessa. Now, I'm not sure if do you really want to hear a sermon on that passage today, Genesis chapter 38. Wasn't that crazy? I think I've stood up with the wrong pieces of paper in my hands. So I might ask my wife to help me out, see if she can find my sermon lying around somewhere. If that's all right. But uh, do you seriously want to hear about it? Like there's, there's a woman that's rejected and despised. There's strange, elaborate marriage customs going on. There's abuse. There's deception. There's prostitution. There's all kinds of shenanigans going on. It's like uh, watching a Dr. Phil episode crossed with Big Brother, crossed with the Kardashians. Or so I've been told. <laughs> or so I've been told. <coughs> um, in fact, oh great, I do have a sermon coming. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you. Can I give, I'll take this one as well. In fact, uh, th- this story, which is a it's atrocious, isn't it? It's, a, it's an utter train wreck. Keep your Bibles open. Open up to Genesis 38 if you're not there. Get, get there right now. Uh, it's full of horrifying, disgusting action. And yet in it, we see God humble a man to repentance in such a way that brings hope, not just for himself, but in fact for the world. In fact, for you this morning. He's humbled and it brings hope. And I want to ask you this morning as we press into this word, have you been humbled? Have you been humbled in your life to the point where you've needed to repent before God of your own unrighteousness? I can think of two big moments in my life that God did this to me. Um, I won't give you all the details, but I remember one of them was really significant for me in becoming a Christian. So I grew up with Christian parents, I'm very thankful for and as I, and I went to a Christian primary school as well, and we'd have a, a church service <clears throat> at this school. Um, the gardener was getting up to speak. He spoke about the cross of Jesus, that Jesus died for our sins. Now, I was there, uh, 10 years old, year four, um, oldest child of a Christian family, always been a churchgoer, going, oh, I, I I see something now that I've never seen before. I was a good kid, you know. I was one of the classroom leaders for the year fours. I was the the example to my younger brothers. I was religious. All of a sudden, it hit me. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And that shows me who I actually am. I, I am unrighteous. In fact, I'm so unrighteous, so sinful, so wicked, that it took the incredible costly death of the Son of God to pay for the sins that I have done and to bring me forgiveness. And it came upon me like a a crushing weight on the one hand, where I was like, I suddenly see something about myself that I've never seen before. And at the same time, just was like, wow, God has been so gracious, so kind and merciful to me. I remember that as like the distinct point where I could say, I, am, I was definitely a Christian after that moment, humbled to repentance. And second period came later in life um, as an adult, where I've been struggling with a persistent sin over many years, and even though I'd shared about it through that time and been transparent about it, I was not changing. And I remember... Uh, a pastor sitting me down and saying, do you actually see your sin for what it is? You're sitting against God, you're not repentant, you're not actually changing, it's only surface level. There's a deeper immaturity that you haven't recognized about yourself. You need to stop your plans for the future, you need to deal with this, you need to repent. And utterly humbled me again. And I want to ask, have you, have you been in that moment? Have you had that experience? It might be as simple as going, well, if you saw me trying to get out of the house this morning, <laughs> I, I've been humbled, or last night, or, but maybe there's something, as you think about a crushing moment in your life, you have something particular in mind, you have something particular, a moment where you've been humbled by God. 
Now, in this train wreck of epic proportions that we're about to read over together, Judah is humbled by God through Tamar, but it brings incredible hope for him, for God's people, in fact, for the whole world, and for you and I this morning. Now, let me pray as we press into this together. Our gracious God and Father, humble us before your mighty hand, that you might lift us up in due time. Speak to us from your word, that we might share in the hope of eternal life. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we look at uh, chapter 38 this morning, we're going to see kind of in five parts to the story. And it begins with Judah, who has turned aside. Right? Genesis chapter 38 uh, verses 1 to 5, Judah has turned aside. Now, if you're just joining us this morning and uh, picking up this story, you might be wondering who Judah is. Well, Judah's the uh, fourth son of Jacob through his wife Leah. Now, he was likely in the pole position for inheriting the blessings of God. His older bro- oldest brother Reuben kind of pushed himself out of his father's favor by sleeping with Jacob's concubine, Bilhah, his oldest, next two brothers in line, uh, Simeon and Levi, you might remember they had murdered Hamor and his son Shechem, and then this whole city to get revenge for the rape of their sister, Dinah. And Jacob's favorite boy, Ju- um, Joseph, with his special robe and his father's favor, Judah had conveniently sold him to slavery. So there's Judah, the number one son left on the books. But he turns aside. You see there in chapter 38, verse 1, at that time Judah left his brothers, he turned aside. He went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hirah. Now we aren't told why, but we might guess. Why has he done this? Well, if you look back up the page, we remember that his father, Jacob, was mourning the loss of his favorite son, Joseph, and he refused to be comforted. And it was Judah's own hands who had sold his brother into slavery. And so maybe, maybe what's going on is he he just doesn't want this constant reminder of his guilt. Here he is day after day seeing his dad weeping. And he's feeling the guilt, the shame rise, perhaps. Maybe he's being reminded day after day as his father mourns that, yeah, sure, Judah got rid of Joseph, but hasn't won him any favor in his father's eyes. He's still not enough. Now, it's not unusual, is it, that a a man with a guilty conscience and a sense of shame moves to get out of the situation. It's not, it's not not uncommon, is it? You know, you think about your own life, perhaps, or your friends, or your family. I mean, how many times has it been that, you know, a relationship's gone bad, something's happened, they've moved, you know, you move, you get out of that relationship, you go find a new set of friends, a new partner, you move workplaces to get away from that. Move cities to get away from that, move countries to get away from that, move churches. How many times does it happen? Trying to, to, trying to bury the reality of the, the guilt and the shame of our past, trying to get away from it. Uh, I don't know, is that why you're here this morning? Has that been you? Or are you contemplating perhaps moving right now? Well, Judah, after having left the company of his brothers, leaving the chosen people of God... Well, he's turned aside to the company of another man, uh, this man from Adullam, whose name was Hira. We don't know much about this man, Hira, except that we think he is a Canaanite. That is, he's from the peoples around. He's not part of the people of God. He worships other gods. And he pops up just at the two kind of pivotal moments, the beginning and the middle of the story, and we see Judah walking with him. And it should remind us of... One of the, the kind of key uh, psalms of the Bible, Psalm chapter 1, do you, do you remember that, this psalm? Psalm chapter 1 opens with these words, Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the council of mockers. But here is Judah partnering up with Hirah and making a new start. What's going to become of him? Well, verse 2, we see he walks in the footsteps of Esau, 
and Shechem. It's lust at first sight. Or as another man put it, it's a union based on chemistry rather than principle. Judah meets a daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her, made love to her. She became pregnant, gave birth to a son. She conceived again and gave birth to another son. She gave birth to still another son. And that, this kind of beginning to Judah's journey with Herah, it reminds us of Shechem seeing Dinah. He saw, he took, he went in. Or well, Adam and Eve in the garden who saw the fruit and took and ate. He's driven by his instincts, his desires. The name of this woman's not given at any point in the story. She's just the object of his desire. But she is identified for us as the daughter of a certain Canaanite. One of a person who's not amongst the people of God. And here you see Jacob again following not just Shechem but Esau. He shows little concern for the promises of God by marrying this woman. You know, these, these women, just like Esau had married earlier, these women who worshipped other gods, they were described like nipple rash on a long run. You know, this constant aggravation to the parents of Jacob. And why was that? Well, because even if you're as wise as Solomon, if you marry someone who worships other gods, then your heart will be led astray. I hope you understand that. And in fact, you see Judah starting to adopt the ways of the Canaanites, even in this story. Halfway through, when Hira pops up in the story again, and sheep shearing time, what does Judah do? Well, he goes to visit a shrine prostitute. And here he's participating in or is at least taking advantage of the idolatrous practices of the Canaanites. That is, to get a, get a bumper crop going, to get more lambs, to get better wool, to get better crops, more rain, all that sort of thing. One of the practices of religion in that time was to go in to sleep with the cult prostitutes and so to stimulate the idols of the gods to fertility. Can you kind of imagine how that sort of system would work? And so often this is a practice... In that time, he, and so Judah, he's not just visiting the local prostitute, he's also participating in idolatry to gain a better sheep-shearing season. Judah is a spiritual backslider. He's walking away from God into spiritual degeneracy and moral failure. And you see just there the connection, right, between him leaving his people and these things happening. It is something to be concerned about, friends. That is, if someone has stopped coming to your small group, if you see that they've stopped coming to church, if st they've stopped, you know, intention, not just because they're sick, not just because life's really hard right now, but they, they've stopped gathering with the people of God, just be concerned in love for that person. Leaving God's people is often a sign that you are leaving God, as Judah did. And as you leave God, leaving his promises, leaving your inheritance, leaving his salvation. Here is Judah at the beginning of our story. He's turned aside. Well, part two, what happens? Part two, we see Judah's sons. And here's where the story meets its big problem. Look at verses 6 to 11. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Ur, we don't know what his wickedness was, but obviously it is very significant. Ur is the first person in the Bible, the first singular individual to be put to death by the Lord. His name uh, reflects on his character or his actions. His name Ur is like the word for sin backwards. So, I don't know if you're choosing names for your kids, you know, don't name them Nis or what would, Snick, Snacky, Snacky, how do you do wickedness backwards? I don't know. Why don't you guys tell me about that later? That's not the names you want for your kids, right? Don't call them wickedness backwards. It, it reflects not just on Ur, does it, but on his dad. Like, this is the spiritual condition of the family. He's so wicked, the Lord puts him to death. What happens to the second boy? Well, 
Onan, another great name. You've got Ur, Onan, and then Sheila, great Australian name. Well, Judah says to Onan, go and sleep with Tamar, Ur's wife, and produce offspring for your dead brother. Now, that might strike you as super weird and, and like repulsive, depending on the culture you've come from, the background you've got. Um, but this was a custom that you see in the Bible, um, and not just practiced within Israel, but you see it in the law in, in Deuteronomy 25, um, that was done to give an inheritance. Uh, and so that both the uh, widowed woman would be cared for, but also that her, inher- her and the family inheritance of the deceased man would be passed on. This is part of pr- passing on the promises of God. You might remember Abraham's promises that God had given to him of a land to inherit, a great people to become, that they would live out being the people of God and to be a blessing to the world. Ur's children were supposed to be the ones who received that inheritance. That was their promise. And Tamar was the one, the wife, through whom it would come. And so we want Tamar to have children. This is a, a kind of a good system. But Onan is wicked as well. And we see in this, again, Judah's failure. See, he doesn't tell Onan to marry her, which is what the Israelite law required. He just says, go in and produce a child through her. He's interested in children for Ur, not the care of Tamar. And then we see Onan's sin. First, he fails to produce an heir. Then we see his sexual abuse of Tamar, because he repeatedly goes into her dangling this false hope. And we see his greed because the whole reason he's denying her children is so that the inheritance won't go to Tamar's kids but will be passed on to him and his kids. He's in it for the money. And then we see his deception. He does this repeatedly. He makes it seem like he's trying to do the right thing, like the problem's with her, but we know, the reader, he's wicked. Friends, the Lord sees these things. He sees them, judges them, and he put Onan to death. That is the good Lord. And so what does Judah do then? Well, he sends Tamar away, verse 11. He, he's afraid for his son, Sh- Shalah, as if Tamar, this woman, this canon woman, as if she was the problem. Rather than recognizing the wickedness of Ur, the wickedness of Onan, the wickedness of his own life, and how this was catastrophically ruining his family, and meaning that the promises of God were being lost for a future generation. Instead of recognizing and repenting of these things, what does he do? He manipulates Tamar. It's like he promises this betrothal to his youngest boy, Shalah, and says, go and live with your father. He can look after you. Don't don't stay here. Don't stay with us. We're not going to provide for you. And they'll give you Shalah when he grows up. If it's a betrothal, he has no intention of fulfilling. He feared Tamar. He should have feared God. He should have feared God. And don't we get this so wrong where we put the blame for things going on on everyone else and not look at ourselves, don't take responsibility, don't own the fact that we need to repent before God, don't fear God, don't take seriously the judgment of God, don't hear God's words to us, like to the Christian church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 6, let me read this to you, verse 9, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, and don't deceive yourself. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Do you hear that, friends? Do you see that as Ur and Onan are put to death? Some sins are obvious, judged by God in a moment. And others trail behind, but they will come into judgment. And so here we are at this point in the story. Tamar has been sidelined. She's been denied children. 
But not just children, she's been left out of sharing in the inheritance promised to Abraham. And now we have this incredible turnaround through an outrageous deception. Again, the deceiver's family gets out deceived. It's brilliant. I love this. It's daring. It's outrageous. It's totally immoral. <clears throat> and yet, it's more righteous than what's done against Tamar. And in the background, I think we're supposed to see, here is the God as well who looks after the fatherless, the widow, and the orphan, and the foreigner. Part three, Tamar deceives Judah. Well, Judah's wife dies, verse 15. Sorry, a bit, bit early, verse, uh, verse 12. When he recovers from his grief, so probably a week later, uh, he went up to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep, and his friend Hurrah the Adjilmite went with him. There you go, the, the blokes are off again. And uh, the fact that we hear about um, Kerem being there, it kind of plays, it prepares us, doesn't it? We, we know here is Judah, walking in these ways, walking with the Canaanite man. We're alerted again to his spiritual, his moral corruption. He has not changed. And Tamar knows this cleverly. She is the heroine in this story. And so she knows Judah and how to take advantage. So what does Tamar see and what does Judah see? We'll have a look what happens verse next, verse 13. Tamar disguises herself, takes off her widow's clothes, covers herself with a veil, and sits down at the entrance to Anaim, which is on the road to Timnah, why does she do this? Why disguise herself in such a way? Well, she saw that though Shelah had grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. And what did Judah see? Well, he saw her, and he thought she was a prostitute. Now, he saw what he wanted to see. He saw what she led him to believe. And we have this wonderful play on words here, where t- Tamar puts a veil over her face, covering her eyes. And she sits down at this place called the entrance to Anaim, which means like the place of the opening of the eye. And here she closes, covers her eyes so she can't be recognized. And here comes Judah, and what does he see? His eyes are opened to a prostitute. And what doesn't he see? His very daughter-in-law sitting in front of him who he's denied. His eyes veiled to everything but his own lust. And so like Leah deceiving Jacob, well, the past over daughter is about to secure her position as well under a veil. And yet Tamar knows this is a desperate, dangerous move. And so she asks for a pledge. And Judah then leaves behind with her kind of the ancient equivalent of his driver's license, his Medicare card, and his, you know, and, his, and his visa card, right? He puts it all on the table, leaves it, leaves it in the brothel. And he says, and I'll come back and pick it up later for the goat. It's like, sorry, I didn't have the cash on me right now, but I'm good for it later. <laughs> but then, after the deception is consummated, Tamar vanishes. The cult prostitute can't be found. And so Judah's signet, which is like the seal of, of his identity, which sort of hung around a cord on his neck, and his staff, which was probably a uniquely carved thing, so that anyone could go, oh, yeah, that's Judah's, that's the public sign of Judah. It's like his number plates on his car. And, you know, that's, that's, his, you know, that's his ID right there, his driver's license. They're gone. She's racked off with it. Why? Well, Judah doesn't press the matter any further. He doesn't want to be a laughing stock. But we've got an idea, don't we? Tamar's gone, she's pregnant, and here we have part four, the trial. The news reaches Judah, verse 24, about three months later, when the baby bump is showing, Judah's told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she's now pregnant. And what does Judah do with this news? What does he do? He says, oh, bring her back into the house. We've got to look after this kid. Finally, Tamar is pregnant. She'll have someone to look after. No, 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 no. This man is a hypocrite. This man is violent. This man is concerned about his reputation. And this man has no mercy, no pity at all. Not just put her to death, 
Bring her out. Let her be burned. And then we have this great tense moment. As she's being brought out, she sends a message to her father-in-law, verse 25. I am pregnant by the man who owns these things. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Isn't it brilliant? Got him got him the witness gets up the evidence is laid on the table the staff the signet the cord who's are these investigate them if you will please identify and judah identifies them and do you see here this this moment this climactic moment where where judah is being unveiled where the deception is being completed where everything is coming to a crashing realization for judah about what has just happened Do you see now the connection between this moment and what he has just done to his own father? Do you hear the parallels? Look look up, if you will, into um, into chapter 37, verse 32, verse 31. The brothers, Judah and his brothers, take Joseph's robe, this ornate robe. They slaughter a goat, dip the robe in blood and take the ornate robe back to their father and they say, we found this, examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. Please identify. And Jacob identified it. And now Tamar comes out with her evidence and she says, examine it. Please identify who these are. The signet, the cord, and the staff. And then Judah identifies them. And so Judah's guilt is being exposed now, but also in the past. And you can just imagine the, the crushing waves of recognition coming down on him. I did this to Tamar because I wouldn't give her my son, Shalah, because my boys were wicked. Not only this time, but I did this to my brother. I sold him into slavery. I deceived my father. He's going to go down to the grave in mourning because of me. And so he utters the most important words in this story. Verse 26, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Shalah. She is more righteous than I. Do you hear his humiliation? <laughs> this, this woman, guilty of adultery, being brought out to be burnt, she is more righteous than I. This Canaanite woman, she is more righteous than I. And I think what we have in this moment is the great humbling of Judah, publicly exposed. It's, it's not just that it's a private thing between her and Tamar, no. Because at least the people who are bringing Tamar out to be kill, to kill her, to burn her, have to see that Judah is now saying, no, let her go, set her free. She is more righteous than I. And it's this moment where God absolutely humbles this man. who breaks into his life and shows him the wickedness of his spiritual life, his moral failure, his mistreatment of this woman. This this breaking in that prepares him, that humbles him, that turns him around. He had turned aside once to go down. He had turned aside a second time to go in to Tamar, and now God's going to turn him around. It's going to bring him to repentance. It's going to prepare him for his own salvation. This is a little bit of a spoiler, but I want you to know what happens after this. Because this story has been, it's interrupting, isn't it? The big story that we're all interested in. What happens to Joseph? He's just been sold as a slave to Egypt. He's had these crazy dreams. He's going to rule over his family. We want to know what's happening to Joseph, right? You've got to come back next week. But we're hearing about Judah because This moment prepares us for the great grace of God. Judah has been humbled here, but he's going to go to his brother 
He's going to bow before his brother and be saved. Not only that, but as he bows and is saved at the hand of his brother, he's going to offer his own life as a pledge. Not his signet, not his cord, and not his staff, but his own life as a pledge for the security of his youngest brother, Benjamin, the new favorite, the brother of Joseph. This, this humiliation that God brings upon his life leads not just to his salvation, but this completely transformed man. So that at the end of his life, at the end of his father Jacob's life, even though Joseph, the, the glorious son, was going to become sort of prince among his brothers, it's to Judah that the promises of God come, that they focus in. So that as we read, Jacob blesses Judah and says, from you will the rulers of Israel come. From you, the Christ is going to come, God's king over the world. From you, Judah, wicked, despicable, hypocritical, violent Judah, I'm going to bring the saviour of the world. Friends, have you been humbled? (laughs) Have you had that moment? Have you had that realisation? It's powerful to have it. To have that moment where you go, no, she is more righteous than I. We have that clarity about your own self before God. In French, I think the way to say it would be, je suis Judah. I am Judah. Have you repented for your sin? This is the kind of people God calls us to be. Humbled. Repentant. Owning our own sin before God. Not casting Tamar away, but going, yes, that was because of me. Not calling for her burning, but saying, yes, that was because of me. And just know, friends, that if, that, that you, if you are in that, that person, if you say, yes, I am Judah, just know as well the grace and mercy of God to you. As you think about the things that you've done and not done in your life, just think again for a moment about the grace and the mercy of God to you. As Judah repents, uh, Ellen pointed out to me, the first person in the Bible to repent. (laughs) Isn't that beautiful? He becomes the object of God's blessing to the world. Friends, where you start as you follow Jesus is not where you you end up. It's not what ultimately defines you. you. When you come to Christ and you're forgiven in Him, you become a new creation. God gives you his spirit to work within you. God powerfully transforms you and sanctifies you. He changes you. Where you start is not where you're going to end up. Don't despair. See that in the humbling of Judah and in your humiliation and repentance, that there is hope, there is a changed life, there is a new life to live for Jesus. He will work in you by his mighty power. And so repent confidently. And this also shapes the kind of church we're to be, isn't it? We're a church for the Judas. <laughs> we're a church for the Tamas. You know, as we gather together on a Sunday, what are some of the things we all might always want to do together? Yeah, we, we, we never want to leave church without having done these things. What are they? Well, one of the critical ones is to confess our sins to God. We come before God as repentant people humble before him. One of the most kind of formative moments in my life for me was when I was studying at uh, Theological College. Our rhythm in the week was to have uh, chapel services. And in these chapel services, we would gather together. And the first thing we do 
as we'd recognize the glory, the holiness, the goodness of our God, and we'd confess our sins before Him together out loud. That just humbled me day after day, week after week, to see God's glory and holiness, my sin and His great mercy. Friends, if you don't see your sin, possibly it's because you don't really see God. You don't really get who He is, right? Because as your idea of the glory of God rises to match who He actually is, you will see that your sin is actually more and more (laughs) clearly defined for you in comparison. And as that trajectory increases in the glory of God and your own understanding of yourself, what you'll find is the grace of God becomes clearer and clearer to you. It hasn't grown greater. It's always been that great. But you're appreciating it so much more. Because that's the God who would bring a man like Judah into his own purposes and kingdom. We want to be the kind of church where the people walk in, we confess our sins, because we know I am Judah. And if you've walked in amongst us, I hope this is the kind of people you've found here. Not people who are proud, not people who are self-righteous, who are condemning others and failing to look in the mirror, but a church of Judas, the church for the sinners, the tax collectors. And finally, I want to say this is this doesn't bring just wonderful hope. This passage brings wonderful hope. Just see that in the ending of this story, right? The last part. It's strange. It's like, oh, this is a very weird birth story. And I hope no one experiences it. <laughs> You've got this crazy twin birth. So you know it's going to get, something weird's going to go down. Any twins in the room? No? Well, you can ask your parents about this if you, if you are a twin. Um, but you've got this strange birth story where we think that Zarah is about to come out. He pokes his hand out. I don't know how that happens. But then Perez breaks out in front and becomes first. That's very weird. It's not normal. It's the only time it happens in the Bible. <laughs> uh, why? Well, don't you see again the purposes of God taking shape, the kingdom of God that's coming? The God who chooses and always chooses the least, always chooses the second, shows favor. And Perez is born. But these aren't just the children of Tamar, are they? The children of Judah and Tamar. They're Judah's sons through Tamar. And Perez becomes the grandfather of King David. And King David becomes the grandfather, with many generations in between, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the obedience of the nations belongs to him. You might have walked in today feeling a bit like Tamar, right? I don't belong here. These are not my people. This God that you're talking about is not yet my God. Now, to get to be part of the people of God and the promises of God, you don't have to go do anything as weird or desperate as Tamar had to do. You just need to turn to the Lord Jesus and you need to know that Tamar herself was included in the people of God. That this woman, with her background, her desperate pursuit of children, she becomes one of the heroes of the Bible. And we read about her in Matthew chapter 1, in the genealogy of Jesus. I'm not sure if this morning you identify more with Judah or more with Tamar. But you see, here are the grandparents of our Lord. Here are the people that God uses. These, these broken, sinful, idolatrous, absolute train wrecks of people that God brings about His sovereign saving purposes through. Will you humble yourself before God? Will you repent? Now, if you've got some really big things you need to work through with that, um, make sure you speak to someone in your small group. You can come and speak to me. But don't leave that unaddressed. And know that from Judah and Tamar, the mercy of God spilled out to everybody. There is hope for you. There is forgiveness. There is a new life in Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, you said 
I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And we repent before you this morning. We acknowledge that even if we haven't lived in the same way as Judah, we are just as far from you by nature. He might be at the bottom of the valley, we might be standing on a mountain, but we're just as unable to touch the stars. Please have mercy on us. Forgive our sins. Humble us. Break through our self-righteousness. And turn our hearts towards you. May we not turn aside, but turn back. So please forgive us, Lord. Renew us and change us. We thank you that where we were is not where we're going. That you are at work in us according to your good purposes. And fight for us the lie that we are too far from you. That what we've done means we could never turn to you. Help us to trust in your great mercy. And to plead with you for that day by day. Because you're so pleased to give us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.